Welcome uh, to the talk about CallNet. Um, CallNet is an internet independent Wi Fi mesh networking app. So, something that you can start and it should um, let you communicate. Um, we started CallNet in uh, 2012 and um, we did it then because when we were looking at the infrastructure that we have, then it's usually um, a star-like uh, built infrastructure. This infrastructure is, of course, uh, problematic or this structure is problematic within infrastructure um, if we are cut off, such as in Fukushima. Um, there is a, was one commenter about uh, the um, earthquake, tsunami, and uh, afterwards nuclear catastrophe in Fukushima, who said that uh, when you are in a dangerous zone, then you usually know much less about it than people that are not nearby, because your infrastructure collapsed. So, when we are disconnected, we are not only or cannot only be disconnected due to a failure or um, uh, some, some catastrophes. Uh, here are listed some of the internet takedowns for political reasons um, since 2007. Um, uh, of many, we just don't know, for example, the, the one in Ethiopia um, in October 2016 that um, was done by the government after 500 protesters got killed by the police. But also here in Germany, there is sometimes a need to maybe not be recognized with your own communication device, because an, a centralized infrastructure gives also the possibility of identifying you central, centrally, um, such as in the anti nazi um, uh, demonstration in 2011 in Dresden, uh, when the police uh, made a huge surveillance um, on uh, the mobile phone network and many people um, in this demonstration got afterwards sued. There are quite some other incidents uh, with rioting. For example, in, uh, also in 2011 in uh, London when the riots happened there um, Britain already has a has a huge surveillance system, uh, but Cameron um, was uh, thinking of taking down all the all the mobile and all the social uh, media, and also to um, ask to BlackBerry to uh, give them their crypto code to be able to read all the messages on the BlackBerry. Benjamin Erdogan um, also used a cell phone, and he was the first victim the first German victim of a drone strike um, in 2010 in Pakistan. He uh, got localized most probably due to the signal of his cell phone. So what can we do with our devices when we take out the SIM cards? Um, one of the possibilities is to, is to do a Wi-Fi mesh network app, such as uh, Freifunk does. And um, that's exactly what we are doing in CallNet. So, we built an app for many devices. We try to cover, of course, most of the um, operating systems such as Windows, uh, Linux, um, oh, and other times Windows. This should be Mac OS, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Android. And all those devices can interconnect directly um, with via Wi-Fi. If someone has an internet access, he or she can share it. And to make it also practical when you're somewhere where the internet got cut off and uh, someone has installed CallNet, you can even download the software from every device so the network can seed itself to other devices. When you start the software for the first time, you can cho choose the language. It's a internationalized um, user interface. It's super simple to do translations. It's just a JSON file. If anyone knows a language that, which is not yet in there, and uh, we also have the possibilities 
to um, use already existing um, Wi-Fi mesh network such as Freifunk. For example, you can just choose your community. Um, at the moment, we will talk about this later. We are based um, on OLSR, um, but uh, we are changing uh, while refactoring right now. So you can also define your own network um, uh, structure if there is not yet a template in. And all this is also super easily done via JSON. Maybe a quick demo. So, okay. Um, that's the interface of Callnet. It's an um, an interface which is uh, done in HTML5, so it looks everywhere the same. You can also build uh, native clients. Um, you have here a chat interface where you can write messages to anyone. And uh, this is now spread over the whole network via the um, OLSR flooding mechanism. You have uh, user discovery, so you see who else is in the network. You can set favorites. Um, you can also write private messages. And yeah, you can of course check the, the slides. We have a file sharing. Um, you can upload uh, own slides. Um, and we also have a voice over IP possibility that you can call every user um, within the system. So I don't know where the other user is. Um, it's not this one. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so you can talk to everyone. And you can also watch the the network. Here we have a very small network, but uh, one can build uh, huge networks, such as this one. This was an instrument installation uh, within the Berlin government district. And we also have a web client. You can test it with your own devices. Right now, there should be Colnet AP. Colnet is used around the world. There are many communities, um, maybe some um, examples. Uh, when we started it, um, there uh, have been some Syrian activists in 2011. They contacted us um, to build mesh networks in Syria to support um, the groups there who try to create a working infrastructure in a space where there is none. Um, in France, there is a special law uh, for people in informal settlements with whom we work since a very long time. Um, there are two anti-copyright infringement laws and um, anti-piracy laws that uh, you have to have a bank account and a fixed address in order to um, be able to get an internet access permanent in France. It's called Hadopi and Lopsy. And, um, well, especially people living in uh, illegality and in informal settlements um, are cut off from uh, the whole digital life. And uh, together with uh, cultural um, platforms in France, in Paris, uh, we built there uh, quite a large um, uh, network that uh, shares the internet. And sometimes these uh, locations are not really in a good spot, so people get very inventive to create huge antenna mats to make a connection possible. Another example is uh, Turkey. We got invited to in Istanbul in, uh, 2013 in, the, in 2014 in the run-up of the uh, local municipal elections. Um, fact there, when we arrived, they changed the whole censorship infrastructure. Turkey has a huge uh, internet censorship. They had 40,000 blocked pages at the time. Nowadays, it's allegedly 100,000. Um, before uh, or when we arrived, it was a DNS censorship, so it was relatively easy to circumvent it. Um, while being there, they changed it and they, they hijacked the whole port 53, so even when you 
were talking to an other name server somewhere outside of Turkey, you always got the government answer. So Twitter was one thing. Um, there was an interface also to set up tweets. We gave a lot of workshops to kickstart the network there. Test? Okay, hi. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the technical side of Callnet. Um, we are currently on GitHub. Um, we use this as a collaboration platform for issues and the code and everything. Um, you can just clone the repo, but you can also just download uh, pre-made installers for basically every platform. Uh, on Linux, we only support the Debian system because it's complicated um so yeah but now it builds on all. yeah but it builds on all uh platforms anyways now so uh matt already talked about this a little bit about uh refactoring and all of this started last year uh when i did my google summer of code uh for callnet and i wrote an encryption module which enables encrypted messages uh user verification and uh, stuff like that because at the moment, if someone sends a message in the network, it's basically not really possible to verify that someone actually said something or that a message is from the person who claims that they are. So we're now using uh, cryptographic signatures and um, communicating those fingerprints uh, to the user uh, to make it to make messages more accountable and to make it possible for people to know if uh, uh, an information that was flooded into the network is uh, legitimate. Now, the problem is that this is a self-contained module uh, and with how CallNet is structured at the moment, or was a year ago even more, uh, it was pretty impossible to integrate some of these features into CallNet. Uh, that is because it grew very rapidly uh, and it has a lot of spaghetti code. Um, there is a lot of duplicate code uh, somewhere that does partially similar things but then is split off into different things. Uh, there's inconsistent tendencies of how to name things and how to call things across the entire library. Um, and it generally makes it not very easy to add on new features. Now, this is our current code base. Uh, that C++ is uh, the uh, GitLab linguist um, being wrong um, because it's header files that are classified as C++, files, C++ files somehow. Uh, GitHub, by the way, does the same thing. Uh, but it's basically all written in C. The front end is in JavaScript and HTML. So uh, there's this lovely um, slide um, which sort of shows and highlights an idealized world. Um, so basically the idea is that there is a GUI and then there is a library underneath it and that does mesh routing with OLSR. And you see these lovely boxes here that are different modules. Those boxes don't exist. Um, they exist. <laughs> they exist, but they're very mingled together into a, a big pile of stuff. So why do we want to refactor? And we've been busy for the last few months um, since actually Summer of Code last year ended and we've been pretty hard at work to change things. Uh, the first thing is that we want to add the compile time of the application, have some verification of that things actually work. So testing, which doesn't, didn't exist before. Uh, we want to be able to maintain the code more easily. We want to be able to scale it better. This, of course, means that we integrate well, the code that was actually written for the encryption into the code base. Uh, but it also means that we can build more specific clients for, um, for different platforms. Because right now, it's sort of you can choose between Qt and GTK as uh, front ends. Um, but other than that, you don't have much choice. Um, and um, anyone who's developed with C will agree with this. It's very error prone and uh, it's very easy to make horrible mistakes and leak uh, memory. And especially with uh, it supposedly being a cryptographically sound application, um, it's very easy to make mistakes and uh, we want to fix that. So how do we refactor? 
Um, first, there is a few things that are platform specific, uh, which we are writing abstraction layers for. So right now, there is a lot of code that deals with, in the library, which deals with specific platforms, be that Windows, or Unix, or Android, or whatever mobile. Um, so this allows us to have platform specific implementations boxed away somewhere, and we don't have to worry about it in the rest of the code. Then, uh, the wonderful boxes that are shown here are actually being created right now. Um, so, um, sorry. So we are basically splitting up the code. We're um, deciding what should be a module, which sometimes isn't actually that easy when a code base uh, grows dynamically and things are duplicated across different modules. It is kind of difficult sometimes to split off what should be one functionality and what is another. Um, so that's actually taken a lot of time. And those modules then have internal APIs uh, between them so that they can be shared between different parts of the library and other libraries as well. Uh, next up, we're actually creating an external libra um, library API, uh, which at the moment doesn't exist either because the front end and back end logic are sort of smushed together. So we're separating that, which means that not only can we um, take over basically all the front end code that already exists, but it also makes it very easy to then write specific front ends for different uh, for different platforms. For example, a native Android client which uses the actual Android uh, GUI toolkit or iOS or Windows or whatever. So people can have more choices in how the application looks on their system. And uh, something that we're still experimenting with, but having quite nice success, is uh, replacing parts of the C code with Rust, uh, which is binary compatible with C. Um, anyone who doesn't know Rust, it's a system programming language by Mozilla, which uh, allows you to write code which doesn't seg fault without any overhead of a runtime. So uh, basically, the idea is that the basic structure, it's too too much work to rewrite everything, but we want to replace individual modules which um, might be more error prone or might have to work more reliably than others in Rust. So what do we actually want to do? Encryption would be nice after a year of not being merged. Um, the next big thing that we actually applied for the prototype fund for, but unfortunately didn't get uh, accepted, is delay tolerant networking. Uh, in short, what that means is that if right now, if someone isn't online on the network, you can't talk to them. Um, even if you've already known them and have them in your contact book. So the idea behind that is that the network can buffer messages up to a certain amount of time, um, which means that you can communicate with people who are offline. Uh, this ha would have the cool side effect that you can actually talk to people who aren't really in your network. Um, if you imagine two networks with a single node on a bicycle uh, going frequently from one network to the other, you could actually talk to someone from the other network without ever realizing that there is someone on a bicycle carrying a message across. Um, additionally, uh, audio and Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, audio and video broadcasts is something that we want to work on. Um, picture podcasts and radio shows across a mesh network. And um, using WebRTC for video calls as well, not just audio voice over IP is, is something that we also want to integrate. That's not all. Um, Matt talked about this with before quickly. Um, right now, everything we do is based on OLSR. Um, that locks us into a few choices on certain platforms. For example, on Android, it means that the device needs to be routed because uh, OLSR does all of its routing in kernel space, uh, which means that you can't just download an app from the Play Store. Um, there is a new technology now that we want to basically use for Android, which is Wi-Fi Direct, which is sort of like a talk, but easier. So instead of maintaining one ad hoc connection to multiple devices, you sort of do direct communications, multiple connections to multiple devices, and it's always a one-to-one -one connection. And you don't need to elevate yourself to do anything. And uh, you do then the routing in user space. Uh, also Bluetooth, because everything is better with Bluetooth. <laughs> 
Um, last thing that this would allow us to do, the, this whole refactoring, the module, mod, making modules of things, um, and the testing is that we can build images for very specific applications, such as an image that you just flash onto a Raspberry Pi and it becomes a server, or an open WRT image that you can flash onto a router and it becomes an infrastructure node which does certain other things as well. Um, we've been at this for actively for about six months now, uh, and we're making pretty good progress. Um, obviously, it's we're only a couple of people, and it's it's a lot of work. But um, we hope that in the next few months we can make a lot more progress, so that we in the next iteration of Summer of Code next year, for example, could have a few other people work on some of the features that we outlined without having to do too much work for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there questions? I have actually two questions. Um, could you say a little bit more about Wi-Fi Direct? Is it proprietary or not? And the other que question is, did you take a look at um, the new wi um, mesh networking of Bluetooth, which could be on mobile phone quite... Do you know what I mean? Okay, so Wi-Fi Direct, as far as I understand it, is uh, an open standard. Uh, it was mostly pioneered it was mostly pioneered by Google for Android after they actually threw out the um, ad hoc networking code from their images, which is why you need the kernel routing anyways, uh, which is kind of stupid, but, you know, it's Google. Um, but I think it's a, it's an open standard to the extent that most people, like, I think it would even, it would work on iOS as well and BlackBerry or whatever other mobile platforms there are. Uh, I didn't know about Bluetooth mesh networking, so I guess I will look into that, uh, because that sounds pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it would be more power saving than Wi-Fi. The, the idea is uh, to go from, a, let's say, a one network centric application to more um, something like a platform on which you can access many different um, networking possibilities and to move away from OLSR. OLSR would still be possible to run, but you have many um, uh, different uh, things where we can then decide on how the routing is done. And of course, there is also uh, 102.11s um, uh, and so on. So there are many possibilities to really um, connect yourself or interconnect yourself um, with your neighbor and to have a, um, an easy base to, to put all that in. Uh, one thing to consider with all of this is that CallNet at the moment is zero config and it will remain this way. So this is all done complete tra completely transparently to the user. No one, like someone who uses CallNet doesn't have to understand any of this and they can just use it. So the idea really is that you download an app, put it on your phone and it'll just talk to whatever is around you and you don't really care if it's via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or it takes whatever your device can give you, so. But if it's configuration um, less, then how do you do authentication in this case? Um, okay, so Zero config as in um, you don't have to set up any network routes to, for it to work. You have to select a language and say, I, my name is Bob. Um, and in the same way, you choose a password. Um, you're actually, it, it generates a key for you, even if you don't really understand what a key is. You just select a password, which then encrypts the key. And it's, you're, you're told, just use this password to unlock the application and it keeps everything that should be secure, secure. So that kind of configuration is, of course, a user has to understand, well, they open an application and they do some stuff, but they don't have to understand the difference between TCP and UDP to do anything, so. Um. Uh, is the current uh, progress on GitHub or is it private? 
GitHub, um, the, the branches are a bit of a mess, um, but basically the latest code is on the develop branch, so if you okay. want to... Uh, what kind of libraries do you use for audio r right now? Um, I actually only know two, uh, two of the libraries because I've worked with them. One, the encryption is being handled by Embed TLS, which is an embedded um, encryption library by ARM, which is very well peer-reviewed and uh, very well maintained as well. Uh, the second one is a library which we actually wrote ourselves for data storage um, because C doesn't really have a standard lib when it comes to data structures. Uh, so we wrote a hash table which uses the uh, cuckoo hashing uh, scheme for space optimization. And how are contexts stored? Uh, are they by IP address or how do you find, find users on the local network? Um, uh, at the moment, uh, that's done by IP address because the the old code base sort of doesn't have the concept of what's a user. It only knows what's an IP address and what's a nickname, and the nickname is then displayed in the user interface. Um, ultimately, it'll be coupled to a fingerprint, so anyone on the network will have a unique fingerprint, and that can then be reused across like yesterday that fingerprint had this IP address now it has this IP address um, but I know the real name of this person and an avatar and whatever so it collects all the information via this this fingerprint which is basically a hash of a of a signature and stuff so um, that's how it could and and everything is stored in a database although we are looking into what's maybe a more efficient way of storing things like that okay, thank you Thank okay. you very much. Thank you.